evening, everybody, and I want to welcome you this evening to tonight's Facebook Live Challenges in Management in Managing Incontinence Associated Dermatitis in the Nursing Home Setting. My name is Alison Schofield and I am Clinical Manager for Mold Digital and I am here this evening representing um, um, Journal of Community Nursing and Wound Care People. Thank you all for joining us this evening. It's such an important evening, isn't it? I mean, have you all been watching the football? And um, good news that England, if you are from England, um, are, are through to the next round. So that is exciting news. So I want to welcome tonight our speaker for this evening, um, and she's a fellow tissue viability nurse friend of mine, Julie Miller Mullings, and Julie is lead nurse for tissue viability and infection prevention and control in the community services at Manchester NHS Foundation Pr Trust, and this evening is supported by Medicare Plus, so thank you to Medicare Plus for giving us this opportunity. Hi Julie, how are you? Hi Ali, I'm fine and uh, thanks for having me here today on the, the Facebook Live. Yeah, it's going to be good and um, we're going to be talking about um, a subject that is close to um, everybody's heart, those of us who are healthcare professionals in, um, you know, managing incontinence associated dermatitis, especially in kind of, you know, the, the care nursing home settings. Um, I'm sure everybody's going to glean some great information through this so just to let you know those of you watching uh, please you know do interact let us know your thoughts and comments throughout and do ask us questions because we will be you know giving um, um some live questions to julie um at the end if you want to ask any questions of me i'm quite happy to to answer anything that you put forward and we will have certificates available at the end which is so important to us aren't they for our revalidation and continuing professional development now, as you can see, Julie and I are in our own homes, so, you know, we are live, and so please do bear with us if we experience any technical issues along the way, you know, how internet is, um, and, um, you know, we, we will sort that out. We've got our great technological team, Mole, on the other end. So, without much further ado, I am going to hand over to Julie, and we are going to continue with our presentation of incontinence dermatitis, associated dermatitis within the care home setting. Julie, over to you. Thanks, Sally. Um, hi, I'm Julie Mullings and I'm the lead nurse for tissue viability and infection prevention and control at Manchester University Foundation Trust. Um, and I lead the service um, in the community. Um, and I've been invited to talk to you, as Ali mentioned before, uh, about the challenges in managing incontinence associated dermatitis in the nursing home setting. Um, and I'm going to share with you some case studies from clinical practice, because I believe linking theory to clinical practice really does enhance learning in a meaningful and useful way. The aim of the session is to discuss the clinical presentation of incontinence associated dermatitis and the impact of managing and treating the condition in a nursing home setting. The objectives will be to revisit the importance of caring for the skin, understand the causes of IAD, describe the potential implications and the effect on the patient's skin, and to summarise how a structured approach can effectively manage problems associated with this condition. So in order to understand how to maintain skin integrity, it's important to revisit the anatomy of the skin. So the skin is the largest organ, and it's an organ because it consists of different tissues that are joined together to perform specific activities. The skin consists of three parts. The subcutaneous section contains a layer of fat that lies between the underlying structures such as muscle and deep dermis layer. It contains blood vessels that supplies oxygen and nutrients to the skin layers. The dermis section contains collagen. That's a protein that provides strength to the skin and it does decline with age, which increases the vulnerability. The elastic fibres also allow stretch of the skin. However, if the skin is overstretched, 
it can rupture, resulting in permanent stretch marks, and this also increases the vulnerability. The dermis also contains sweat glands that regulate body temperature, hairs that insulate and sensory nerves that produce pain. The epidermis is the top layer and it creates a waterproof barrier. It protects and regulates the function of the skin. It's essential that we understand how to keep skin healthy. And the pH of healthy skin is between four and six, providing an, an acidic environment that supports the bacteria that naturally lives on the surface of the skin. And if the skin is intact, they help to prevent the invasion of non-resident bacteria. An alkaline environment increases skin sensitivity, can cause inflammation and potentially start to cause a breach in the skin and this increases the risk of infection. An estimated 40 million adults experience incontinence in England. And in this population, they're particularly at high risk of developing incontinence associated dermatitis. And I think that this slide really does contextualize the magnitude of the problem IAD is the most common and widely recognised form of moisture associated skin dermatitis. And this is due to prolonged or chronic exposure of urine and or stool, particularly liquid stool, stool on the skin. It can appear in the perianal area, the scrotum, the groins, the buttocks, gluteal cleft, and even extend down to the inner and posterior thighs. Up to 41% of care home residents have incontinence associated dermatitis and this is due to unmanaged incontinence needs and I think this slide really highlights that potential risk of this population developing IAD. To prevent IED, I think it's firstly, it's important to actually recognise those patients that are at risk. We need to remove the causative factors where possible and provide appropriate skin care. We, can, we should consider if the patient needs help with toileting. If we don't, then the patient is going to be at risk of developing IAD. We might need to consider if the patient requires continence products. And if we are using continence products, we might need to review the fit, the type of product, because most pads are designed to absorb fluid and issues with fecal incontinence do require a specific product. It's important that we care for the patient's skin in an appropriate way to ensure its integrity. Fundamental aspects of IAD are prevention and management, and it should be based on the following. Skin cleansing to, re to remove contaminants and microorganisms, application of skin moisturizers, and an impermeable barrier that provides total skin pro uh, protection. And if we could communicate like we would on a face-to-face -face teaching session, I would ask you as the audience, is soap and water the most commonly used cleanser out in practice? Is this what we use commonly to clean patients' skin with? Well, certainly research tells us that we do. And I personally would be a very happy lady if we were to ban the use of soap and water for cleansing tomorrow and we moved to a soap substitute. Keeping the skin hydrated and protected is an essential preventative measure and we can't do that by using soap and water. So why is soap so detrimental to the skin? The acid mantle is a fine acidic film on the surface of the skin and it acts as a barrier. The sebum produced by the sebaceous glands in the skin where mixed with sweat produces that natural acid mantle. 
Frequent, frequent washing decreases the skin's natural defences. It reduces the sebum and the pr protective bacteria living on the skin. And this is further exacerbated by soap, as soap produces an alkaline environment. There are various alternatives to traditional soaps. We personally use aqueous uh, cream in our trust as our first line soap substitute. We can consider emollients as soap substitutes, non-scented pH balanced soap. What we need to do is avoid cleansers with alcohol and preservatives because that will dry out the skin and potentially cause irritations. And we should be using disposable wipes that are soft and gentle and not perfume baby wipes. And we should be patting the skin dry and not rubbing it because all of these will impact on the skin integrity. So it's important to obtain the correct diagnosis of any wounds to the skin in order to provide the correct treatment plan. And often category two pressure ulcers and IAD are confused. And actually, I understand why this uh, might be the case, because both of them do have similar characteristics. Superficial skin loss, predominantly granulating, maybe containing areas of superficial slough. However, there are key characteristics that we can use to differentiate the two. And the characteristics of IAD will generally be widespread, widespread blotchy erythema, diffuse or irregular edges, often because of the urine and the moisture sitting on the skin, shiny wet skin, the wounds and the breaks to the skin are superficial. There is no necrosis with IAD and the damage can actually be linear if it presents in skin folds. And there can often be a leakage of serous ex uh, exudate or possible bleeding depending on the severity. And as we mentioned before, IAD can occur in skin folds in the anal cleft or as perianal irritation with irregular shapes. It can, it can extend over a bony prominence and become a combination of pressure and IAD. IAD occurs following prolonged contacts of urine or feces with the skin. Damage caused by AD is more susceptible to friction, shearing, and at much greater risk of uh, patients developing pressure damage. So simply put, IAD is an irritant contact dermatitis commonly caused by incontinence. And if the skin becomes too wet and waterlogged, it can often begin to swell. It can often look white or paler in the natural colour of the skin. The capacity of the skin to limit the either the accumulation or excretion of substances is affected with increased permeability. And that skin balance is completely affected. Increased friction, depending on the area, can contribute to pressure ulcer development. And the urea is converted into um, ammonia and this is corrosive to the skin and it causes burning, pain and tissue breakdown. Washing with soap and water will increase the alkalinity of the skin and exacerbate the skin breakdown. Microbes can then thrive in broken skin and the patient is then more susceptible to infection. Liquid faeces causes more skin damage than solid faeces as there's more digestive enzymes present and that causes more destruction to the skin. The enzymes in faeces also exacerbate the effects of urine on the skin. Incontinence of urine in faeces is more damaging to the skin than either type of incontinence on its own and often resulting in a severe dermatitis 
and particularly if that's not identified early on and treated appropriately. AID can cause considerable pain, often burning in nature, stinging, and considerable suffering to the individual. And they're experiencing that every time there's an episode of incontinence. And if you think about a time when you've burnt yourself or you've sustained a superficial graze, it's really painful. And that's because the nerve endings have been exposed because of that loss of the epidermis and the exposure of the dermis. And for me, I was thinking, how, how would this potentially feel um, to a patient? And I should imagine it feels like putting alcohol on an open cut. And I think with the current pandemic, we're gelling our hands all the time. And if you've ever had a little paper cut to your finger and you put that alcohol gel on there, the pain is really quite severe. And I imagine that that's how patients must be feeling constantly. So I'd like to share some case studies with you from cl clinical practice, really to consolidate the previous slides and to link that theory into real life practice. So case study one is a 74 year old female with a history of dementia, hypertension, left CVA, poor nutrition and weight loss. She's unable to independently mobilize or perform activities of daily living and she is incontinent of urine and feces. The current treatment plan um, was daily bed baths using soap and water. Following episodes of incontinence, baby wipes were being used to clean and an antiseptic, antiseptic healing cream was being applied to the red and excoriated groins and bottom. Containment products or continent products were being used and a washable bed pad. So the key considerations of the case study is the patient's weight loss and the immobility because both of those elevate the risk of pressure damage occurring, poor nutrition as this will affect healing, the use of soap and water and perfume baby wipes, this will increase the alkalinity of the skin, it will cause increased vulnerability and that potential of skin breakdown or exacerbating skin breakdown. So the tissue viability treatment plan was to wash with aqueous cream, to apply um, the barrier film, which was the Mediderma um, S total barrier film, referral to the bladder and bowel team and a referral to the dietitian. We stopped the use of the washable bed pads, <coughs> excuse me, as that um, provides an additional layer holding the moisture next to the skin um, and could compromise the efficacy of the pressure reducing equipment. The use of antiseptic creams um, do not provide a, a barrier. They dry the skin out and they can also block the incontinence pads so they do not work effectively. Case study two is an 80 year old female with a history of diabetes and peripheral vascular disease. And this patient is also obese. She is bed bound and incontinent of urine and feces. The current treatment plan was daily bed bath using soap and water and following every episode of incontinence and foam dressings were being applied to the multiple superficial broken areas to both buttocks. Continence products were being used and the patient was nursed on a dynamic mattress. The key considerations of this case study is that the patient is immobile and um, the patient um, is obese. So we have predominant skin folds that will be more susceptible to moisture. Um, we've got the immobility, which gives the increased risk of pressure ulcer development. Also, um, if 
the patient's diabetes is not under control, then there's a risk of infection. The soap and water increases the alkalinity of the skin and increases the vulnerability and also increases the risk of, of skin breakdown. The use of foam dressings increases the risk of skin stripping and constantly putting them on and off will cause that inflammatory response. And this isn't effective for healing because the dressings aren't on long enough and it's not a cost effective way to treat the patient. So the tissue viability treatment plan was to wash with aqueous cream, to apply the Mediderma S total barrier film. We advised no dressings because they were not effective um, in managing this condition. A referral to the bladder and bowel team, also to the dietitian and the diabetes specialist nurse. Case study three is um, an 87 year old male with a history of prostate cancer. He has restricted mobility and uses a frame and is incontinent of urine. The current treatment um, was to wash um, or to shower or to have a bath using soap and water and following episodes of incontinence an emollient was being applied and an antifungal ointment. And these were being applied to the red and excoriated area. The containment products were being used um, to manage the incontinence and the patient was nursed on a high specification foam mattress. So the key considerations of the case study is that the soap and water increases the alkalinity of the skin increases vulnerability and increases the risk of skin breakdown. The emollients affect how the pads work and antifungal creams should be used when there's an actual fungal infection. So the tissue viability treatment plan was to wash with aqueous cream, to apply a Mediderma S total barrier cream the emollient ointment and the antifungal cream was discontinued because there was a misdiagnosis and the patient didn't actually have um, a fungal infection. A referral to uh, the bladder and bowel team and the patient was started on a sheath and a urine bag, which was a far more effective way to manage the incontinence. Case study four is a 75 year old male with a history of diverticular disease. He's independently mobile for short distances and is incontinent of urine and feces. The current treatment was to wash, shower or to have a bath using soap and water and baby wipes following each episode of incontinence. Multiple broken areas um, were evidenced to the natal cleft and the buttock, and they were being treated with a large sacral foam dressing. Containment products were being used um, to manage the patient's incontinence, and the patient was not being nursed on any pressure relieving or reducing equipment. So the key considerations of the case study was Obviously, the diagnosis of the diverticular disease. Um, this um, was produced, the patient was then producing liquid feces. This really increased the risk of skin breakdown due to the, the number of digestive enzymes. It also exacerbated the effects of the urine on the skin. The soap and water increases the alkalinity of the skin and increases the vulnerability. The baby wipes were perfumed and an irritant to the skin and they were causing pain to the patient. And I ask you this question, would you spray, spray perfume on an open wound that you had? I think the answer to that would be no, because it would be extremely painful. But essentially, that's what we were doing using the baby wipes um, on that IAD. The large sacral foam was not effective treatment as it was being constantly taken on and off. So therefore it wouldn't promote healing and it would potentially cause infection if the feces 
got trapped under the dressing and next to the skin. So the tissue viability treatment plan was to wash um, with the Mediderma Pro foam and spray incontinence cleanser and apply the skin protective ointment. Um, the large sacral foam dressing was discontinued and a referral was made to the colorectal surgeon and the bladder and bowel team. Case study five is an 83 year old female with a history of rheumatoid arthritis. She's bed bound and she declines to be repositioned. She has capacity to make her own decisions and understands um, the um, potential ramifications of not being um, repositioned. And that was her choice. She was incontinent of urine and feces. And as you can see from the picture, the IAD is severe. Um, and it was that severe that it spread in terms of the location and it extended over the sacral bone. And she's now developed a category three pressure ulcer. The current treatment was a bed bath using soap and water and follow, following every episode of incontinence. The multiple broken areas to the buttock and the category three pressure also to the sacrum was being treated with the hydrofiber and multiple foam dressings to cover the area. Containment products were being used and the patient was nursed on a dynamic mattress. The key considerations of the case study is that the patient was bed bound, so was therefore always at an increased risk of pressure damage and certainly coupled with the fact that the patient declined to be repositioned, further increased that risk of pressure damage. She had um, extensive IAD that, as I mentioned before, then spread over a bony prominence, developed into a category three pressure ulcer. Obviously having um, a deep pressure ulcer such as a category three with the incontinence um, issues increase the risk of infection. And if the pressure also was to further deteriorate to a category four with exposed bone, then there's a risk of osteomyelitis. Soap and water is being used and that increases the alkalinity, increases the vulnerability and increases the risk of skin breakdown. The hydrofiber and the multiple, multiple foams that were being put on and off numerous times in the day, potentially were causing more irritation to the skin and inflammation. Obviously on such fragile skin, we're then contributing to skin stripping. Um, and like I mentioned before, if feces is then trapped next to the skin, then this can potentially cause infection. This then causes a high risk of potential sepsis and hospitalisation. And that obviously is, is the reality of such extensive wounds. So the tissue viability treatment plan was to um, wash um, with the Mediderma Pro foam um, spray, incontinence spray and cleanser and to apply um, a skin protectant um, ointment. We were then, um, we stopped the, the multiple foams and we used an alginate gel into the sacral um, category three pressure ulcer. And we'd apply that every time the patient was washed after, after an episode of incontinence. And then we referred to the bladder and bowel team because we, we really needed a joined up approach um, with this patient. So I think it's, it's really important after sharing those case studies with you to have um, a clear and standardised plan of care for patients who are experiencing or are at risk of IAD. And, and the treatment that we should be using should be evidence-based and things like emollients and antiseptic creams are not evidence-based and can con uh, contribute to exacerbation of these problems. And it's really important that we understand appropriate product placement 
So we understand where those products should be used at those different points in managing patients' IED. And we should be using a step up and down approach depending on the severity. You know, and although this slide provides an overview of correct product placement, really for me, it's all about the prevention. Um, and this prevention um, care plan and uh, that, we that we should be putting in place will encompass then the appropriate cleaning regimes and cleansing regimes and the use of an impermeable barrier to repel moisture because it's much easier to prevent than it is to treat some of these and particularly the severe um, IAD. So really sort of focusing on summarising the presentation and those take home messages that I, I would like you to, to consider after the presentation is that the holistic assessment is vitally important. So not just focusing on one as aspect of, of, of the patient's condition and obviously in this case the, the IAD, but really looking at that patient in a holistic way because we've spoke before how IAD can, can increase the, um, you know, the, the likelihood of, of, of um, a pressure ulcer occurring. So, you know, poor nutrition can affect healing. You know, incorrect, you know, dressing management can exacerbate the problems. And I think that early recognition of the risks, and if we recognise them early on in the patient's care, then we can prevent things. And like I said before, you know, prevention is, is far easier to do than to, to, to treat and to cure something. To stop using soap and water, because as we mentioned before, that increases the alkalinity and the skin uh, vulnerability. And to stop using baby wipes, they're perfumed, they're, they are extremely pay, painful for the patient. And to use that correct product placement and that step up and down approach depending on the severity of the IAD. We should be using standardized care that's evidence-based, but that meets the patient's needs. And that should be reflected in our care plans. And in our trust, we use algorithms to help support the nurses in that decision-making process. And that referral and collaborative working, that MDT approach, I find, often provides the best outcomes. So I will hand you back to Ali now um, for the question and answer session. Thank you, Julie, so much. Do you know what? You had some, you had so many case studies in there. That was amazing. Some, you know we see don't we? we we see and you know the audience who are watching will feel the same we, we, we see so much in in clinical practice that you know you, you think today in this day and age we we, we kind of don't see that i i know i've seen, i used to be a district nurse like you used to be a district nurse and you know when you're out there in the community and you see elements of self-neglect and you see such severe incontinence associated dermatitis you know, MSD, you know, whichever terminology that you use in practice. And, you know, we, we, we think that we're never going to, you know, with products and things that are available today, that we, we, we're kind of not going to see that. But we do, don't we? We do. We do, Ali. And I think as well, you know, as, as I mentioned before in the presentation, it's so important then to actually identify those patients who are at risk. Because as you all know, in practice, it's not easy to treat. IAD at all you know we can't use dressings you know we we can't put something on and leave it it is a constant um you know regime and it is much 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 more difficult to treat so it's that early recognition and thinking you know could that patient go on to develop that that we're really you know and intervening early on and that really good skincare just that basics of not using soap and water generally on a patient and particularly with our elderly population the skin's drier anyway it's we've lost that elasticity so they're far more at risk of of having breaches to to the skin integrity so i think you know a really good 
you know, moisturiser and then using those impermeable barriers to, you know, repel that moisture. It sounds simple when we discuss it, but, you know, it doesn't, it's not always recognised in practice. So I certainly hope, you know, through presentations like this and through, you know, our conversations that that just really raises the profile. Yeah. And don't you think sometimes it's the simplest things? It's like, it's skincare, isn't it? And we, we have so much focus on, we always have done for years on pressure ulcer prevention, pressure ulcer risk assessment. I mean, this is hand in hand, isn't it? And it needs to be incorporated in part of that pressure ulcer risk assessment. Absolutely. And I think we've become so focused on, on you know, preventing pressure ulcers, managing pressure ulcers, which absolutely is a very important part of what we do. But sometimes we need to go that step back from that and think about, you know, that maintaining the skin integrity in the first place. Yeah. And you mentioned like through your presentation, you had talked about like algorithms, you know, pathways, algorithms, roadmaps, you know, it really standardizes the care doesn't it and it does give people that pathway to follow and things like I know in practice I've always been asked a lot so oh well you know is it pressure ulcer is it is it you know a moist lesion is it and you know often sometimes you'll find and people say shall I put a dressing on that and absolutely. yeah absolutely and and I think that you know as I mentioned before the the category twos particularly in and and moisture associated skin damages they are often you know it's a difficult one to call sometimes and I think you know district nurses nurses working on the ward in nursing home they're not just focusing on wound care either they're doing a myriad of things so that's why we found that you know algorithms or a simple table that just reminds you of the process of is this pressure damage? Is it skin? Um, is it some moisture associated skin damage? And that simple checklist, because then, unlike us, we, we, you know, we're tissue viability and that's what we do all day long. But, you know, in reality, and we've been district nurses, that's one element of, of you know, your, your workload and those patients that you see. So I think that I always certainly liked as a district nurse back in the day when we had our A five diaries and we weren't all on iPads I'd like a little guide you know particularly when I was newly qualified and new to the district just before you went into the patients or even when you came out you wanted a, a quick reference to is is that what I thought it was or did I do the right thing or that little if you know what you're going into that little read beforehand so you felt more confident when you went in there I've been doing this for years and <laughs> actually oh. you know they really just I think help just as an aid memoir. Yeah, that's why we like diaries because we couldn't put, we couldn't, <laughs> always put these reference things in the back, couldn't we? But that's what, I mean, it's like, you know, obviously Medicare Plus is sponsoring this, this this evening and, and their smart tool that they use with that, that toolkit thing and that, you know, their smart guide. It, it um, I, I, I love that. It's just, the, it's the simplicity of things, isn't it? Pressure also versus kind of, you know, moisture lesion type thing. And, and I think as well, Ali, when you, when it's not just text and you've actually got a visual picture it means something to you because then you can relate that to the patient that you see so I do think that that really does you know help to differentiate you know what what you're treating and, and how to treat it and like you said something that's simple it's a quick reference guide that you can read in a couple of minutes and think oh yeah I remember that now that's all you need that little prompt sometimes yeah. And we were talking beforehand, we were saying, obviously, with COVID-19 pandemic and lots of things have changed for everybody and the way we deliver our education. This is why we're here this evening, you know, because we're having to do a lot more virtually and things like that. So anything that's kind of visual and virtual and things that, you know, uh, you know, really good messages people can take away is, is just vital, isn't it, today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got some, we've got lots of questions, you know, coming in from, we've had a good audience this evening and lots of people um, are asking questions. And one of the things people are asking about, obviously we, 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 you know, we know we do use barrier products in practice for, um, you know, as people who are at risk, who have incontinence to prevent incontinence associated skin damage, those who have it to then resolve 
Um, and people are saying, you know, with incontinence pads, which obviously is part of an incontinence assessment, they have to be assessed as suitable for that peer person. But, um, you know, not all barrier creams, you know, there are various different types, aren't they? You know, some are all suitable for wearing, when wearing continence products or not. No, and I think the case studies, I tried to encompass some of that, um, Ali, really, because, you know, we will often use emollients as a skin, as, as a soap substitute, or we might use emollients on a dry skin. But if you start putting a thick layer of a, and of an emollient on somebody's bottom and they've got incont you know and they're incontinent of, of urine or feces that can really then block the yeah. path so it, it stops that action of actually drawing the urine away and locking it away in the pad because it can't get through that thick barrier of, of emollient and the things that you know we see a lot in practice and I think it it comes from when we've had um, you know our own children and I know I could have to hold my hands up and say I did it these antiseptic healing creams you slap them on and you think you're doing something good and actually you know and and it will say on some of them for treatment of, of, of pressure ulcers and you know that's very much the misleading but what it actually does is it really dries out the skin which then increases the vulnerability and you put that then with washing with soap which further dries out the skin and also those type of products will also again block the pad and stop that 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 mm. the way that they work in drawing the the moisture away so, no, so not all barriers i think we have to remember it's got to be one of the impermeable type of barriers that you know we've we've discussed that repels the moisture doesn't put that thick layer of the skin, uh, that, that thick layer across the skin and therefore then doesn't affect how the pads work. And it's that thick zinc based stuff we used years ago in nappy rash. Absolutely. You, know, you can buy in the pharmacy, but yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they can just clog, clog those products up. And you mentioned as well about like baby wipes. And a lot of people think, well, oh, well, we kind of use things like that. And like, oh, God, it made my, my toes curl when you said putting a perfume product onto sore skin because sore skin, like which is associated with the continent associated dermatitis, it's that it's kind of that superficial layer of skin, nerve end endings are exposed. And that is so sore, isn't it? To the Absolutely. patient so you throw something like that in there and oh my goodness they're gonna really suffer with that absolutely and i was discussing this presentation with with one of my colleagues um sue mason she could well be on yeah, the I know. Oh, I know sue. hi <laughs> sue <if you're> watching. <laughs> it was sue that actually when we were having a conversation she was the one that said well, would you spray perfume, or, 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 you know, on your bottom if you had an open wound? And absolutely, you, you wouldn't do that. No. You know, and, and thinking about and trying to have, you know, that empathy about, you know, how, how that patient must feel. And, and unless you've had um, IAD, you're not going to know. And the only way I could possibly try and think of how that would feel is literally, I did have a paper cut on my finger that I didn't even know I had. I gelled my hands and thought, oh, you know, what the heck? It was just so painful. Just a tiny, that was a tiny little nick. And that alcohol on there, you know, it was so painful. And, and in my head, that's, if that's happening after every episode of incontinence, you know, the quality of life for, for a patient, you know, having to endure that however many times a day. And I think that's why as well, you'll see, in the treatment, a lot of them were, we had referrals on. So it wasn't just the treatment, it was again, going back to that holistic assessment. Is there anything else that we can do? Is there, you know, certain products that especially that the bladder and bowel teams know about, the man with the diverticulitis, he was actually still relatively young and quite, you know, fit and well really. So actually sending him back to the colorectal surgeon for a review, was the right thing to do for him, for him because you know his skin you know was just so excoriated as it will be as we mentioned with that mm. that liquid stool and all those enzymes are so destructive to the skin and then you know further exacerbating the 
effects of the urine on the skin. So it was certainly, you know, worth revisiting that, um, you know, with the colorectal surgeon. So it, it really is sometimes getting other people involved where appropriate to get that best outcome for yeah. them. Um, I mean, you know, obviously our title tonight, we're talking about nursing homes, but the nursing home setting, residential home setting, you know, patients at home. I know we've got district nurses watching tonight as well. Um, and, you, you know, it is about that with that. It's that holistic assessment, isn't it? That continence assessment. And, you know, it isn't just always appropriate to, oh, well, the patient's incontinent will provide a pad. It's about, well, what is the root cause of that urine incontinence, fecal incontinence especially? And like you said, that referral onwards, because it might be that they can have... I mean, diverticular isn't uncommon in people of an, an older age. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we know the damage that faeces can do. So it's getting to the root cause of what the problems are and are there other interventions and treatments. And the meanwhile, then we're going to do our preventative skin care um, with, with, with what we have. Yeah, absolutely, Ali, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and somebody's asked a question about um, other types of uh, kinds of moisture-associated moisture skin damage, because obviously that's an umbrella term. Um, and um, we can say, obviously, within guidance of the um, um, NHS improvement in, I think it was 2018, wasn't it? They, they changed the guidance so that, that we, we, we all know in our NHS trust, we report pressure ulcers, we put them through as a serious incident in our reporting systems. And then that changed. So we do report moisture associated skin damage. Now, I know in my trust that I've just come from, we only reported incontinence associated skin damage within that. But I know in some trusts, they, they kind of took the whole umbrella so i do you want to mention the other ones yeah, absolutely and, and, and we do report but i must admit um ali i think that you know iad is the one that's most reported however you know when you are working if you're working in the acute sector and i know today was a focus on 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 nursing homes but i know that there's people logged in from that work in lots of different yeah. areas and, and like I said, I'm a district nurse by background, but when we had to cover the acute, which we did for seven and a half years, which was quite outside my comfort zone because I've not worked in a hospital for a long time, but actually really valuable experience because then we had to go on to places, you know, intensive care and intensive cardiac um, units as well. And what we realised with, with those patients is the, the, the continence was controlled they had they had cathetering because they were managing you know fluid input and output and that was obviously part of you know their treatment being acutely unwell and um, sometimes they used you know um other other products the um oh gosh it's it's gone out of my the um the bowel management systems oh so, yeah so you yeah. don't have as much as many issues with with AID because you could use other products that you wouldn't be able to use in a nursing home but what you did have was those patients were often very edematous it's very warm in intensive care so they actually got moisture in the skin folds so it was caused by sweat and excessive fluid because they were very edematous and then it was pooling in areas such as the groins under breasts under if there was, you know, any aprons abdominally under there, gluteal clefts, all the places that we mentioned before. So that was really a, a different way of, of, of looking at it. Also, we, you know, we've, we've got patients that have got really highly exuding wounds. That obviously causes moisture. We, we would always refer to it as maceration, wouldn't we? And, and we still yeah. do, but it's actually a form of, you know, moisture associated skin damage. And, and, you know, patients with stomas and yeah. stomach bags, obviously we talked about before that irritation and inflammation and if any of, um, you know, the feces is leaking under the, the, um, the stoma bag, then it can cause, and that can be really difficult to manage as well. So you've got your peristomal um, MASD as well. So there's, there is, it isn't just AID, it's quite an umbrella that, that you know, encompasses lots of different reasons that you know we, we get moisture problems with the skin and so that's why it is 
you know, moisture associated skin damage. So whatever it is, whether that's excessive sweating, whether it's excessive, you know, moisture from wounds, whether it's incontinence, you know, all of those fit under that umbrella into Trigo. We have, we have, we have a few of those as well, Ali, with, um, you know, under ladies with, you know, larger breasts in groins as well. Again, difficult one. You can't, and I have seen them dressed with, with, with dressings because as nurses, like you say, we, we want to give a pad or we want to put a dressing on because as nurses, we're used to doing something and we, 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 and we think by, you know, that's the right thing to do. You know, with a not with a wound anywhere else, that's what you do. It's about moist wound healing. You put a dressing on, but you know those rules have to really be left aside when you're dealing with something that's whether that's um, IAD or any type of moisture, because they're just it's just not appropriate. Because unless you can remove that moisture, then the dressing's not going to stay on, and it's on and off. Whatever. You put a hydrocolide on or a foam dressing, you're just adding more moisture, aren't you? You're yeah. just making, making the problem worse. And, and like you say, there's that umbrella of those, you know, that there's that variety of different things. And, and the treatment, you know, we, we can we, we still want to use our, whether it's right, the peri wound, peristomal, intertrigo, you know, we still use it. That, you know, good skin cleansing, I can't emphasize that enough. Absolutely. Good washing. Patting dry, not rubbing, you know, and and using of the barrier products, and you know, it's the same situation, isn't it? You know, in, in nursing homes, obviously, that's what you know that that was our initial focus. But you know, obviously, we 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 must always talk about things in a broad range. But you know, I in, I always think nursing homes and patients in nursing homes, and 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 I will say this sometimes, maybe getting in a quite, don't mean this to be detrimental to the nursing care at all in nursing homes, but I mean, such as patients in residential homes have access to district nursing and they might be nurse prescribers. So when it's access to certain things, I wonder if in nursing homes, sometimes there's that struggle of, because they, you know, prescriptions have to come from the GP and it's having, you know, do they have those pathways of care in place, you know, like we would in community services and things, are they going to, how do they overcome that? I know, and I think that's a really, it is a difficult situation because essentially, you know, the nursing homes are private businesses, aren't they? Yeah. And so they don't fall under that NHS health umbrella. I know the residential homes are, are a little bit different because that nursing need is provided by a nurse working in the NHS. And yes, often, you know, it can be that we're then waiting for prescriptions that then you know by the time you've got it you're at least three days four days oh, at least i waiting for a product that then encourages that you'll go and get something that you know if you're treating mr smith you'll go and get something off mr brown because you've not got something you know we shouldn't be doing that and and something that's prescribed to a patient but you know sometimes you haven't got a lot, a lot of choices. Not all specialist nurses go into nursing homes, Ali. That's really dependent on, um, on, on whether you, there is a service level agreement to provide that service. So, you know, the nurses in the nursing home will really, you know, they don't get the same access to education. So no. they're not routinely, you know, involved in, in, in link nurses or that regular, um, you know, education that, again, district nurses, nurses working in, in the acute. I mean, we try to in the community, um, and obviously there's not the resources, Alice, so we're a, a small team covering, you know, a massive geographical area with, you know, our priority is you've got to train the district nurses, you know, you've got to train the AHPs that work in your area. However, you know, well, we obviously do always teach whilst we're, you know, at the bedside and when we're with the patient. And what we always do, Ali, is that we will always offer any of our algorithms or, you know, to help and support, you know, that, that best practice. And I think, you know, people like Medicare Plus as well will share those, you know, algorithms, um, you know, and pathways with you know the, the nursing homes so you know we have offered comes a bit difficult when it comes to documentation because then obviously you have sort of legal considerations because you don't sit with us but you know we we do help and guide and support as much as possible and 
at least once a year we have a big um study day where we will bring in all the care homes but that's not enough yeah. that's not uh, enough, anywhere near enough and like i said it's 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 then sometimes on a yeah. patient by patient basis and doing that bedside teaching it's it's hard isn't it, it is i know it's a, it, it's it's all to do with commissioning and commission of servicing to, to nursing homes is very different I did cover my nursing homes. I maybe did a bit more than, you know, what was expected. Yeah. Of. But I, I was like you, I was kind of on my own in community service and it's and it's difficult from, from what you can provide. So that's why our industry partners are really important because they can help and support us in that education. We're nearly coming to the end. And I, and I just want to mention somebody's asked about kind of during the pandemic about increasing IND. And, and I know, obviously we don't report nationally our pressure ulcer incidence anymore so we don't report our the the new reporting of um, moisture associated skin damage but you know i think it's probably fair to say in all areas that, that these things in certain areas you know we, we kind of has have had any an increase in in these things happen would you would you agree Absolutely, Elena. and I think you know it, it's certainly multifactorial. You know, uh, the, sort of the reasons behind it, but we've seen an increase in pressure ulcers, an increase um, again in wounds generally, and you know, a lot of it, and certainly in uh, from a district nursing point of view, and getting access into the nursing home. Everybody was extremely scared. They didn't want nurses going in. And in the nursing homes, they were trying to protect their patients. So therefore, they didn't want specialist nurses coming in if it could be avoided. A lot more was done, maybe a telephone advice. We haven't always got, they haven't always got access to, you know, photography, you know, or a camera to send an image. Um, so, and then, and then the same in district nursing patients were saying, I don't want you in and even to the district nurses net, let alone a district nurse a specialist nurse you know and then you before you know it and the care is coming you've got three extra people in your home and you don't want anybody in at all so I think that that patients have they've done a lot of self-management but not necessarily in partnership with you know a healthcare professional yeah because uh, you know there is a place for for that shared management but it yeah. needs to be in partnership. And I think people have thought, you know what, I'll just deal with this on my yeah. own. I and think you're right. And, yeah. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's, do you know what? We could chat all night, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Next step is, yeah. And uh, yeah, the self-care is a whole other conversation that we can have. I'm, I'm very conscious of the time and we've, um, yeah. And uh, we're coming up to uh, kind of half past eight now. So I'm, I'm going to draw to a close. And I want to thank you so much, Julie. I've really enjoyed that. And I've really enjoyed chatting to you um, this evening. It's been absolutely um, fantastic. So I want to just give to you, or everybody watching, and again, thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And I want to give you a call to action now. So I want to give a big thank you to Medicare Plus for supporting today's event. And so you can receive a free sample of Mediderma S Total Barrier Film Applicator. So you just need to visit the mediCarePlus.co.uk forward slash sample. And the link is on the screen. So um, and we'll be in the comments for you to follow. There's also a certificate link which is on the screen and that will be available in the comments so make sure you get that for your revalidation and uh, CPD. The recording and the slides as always will be available on our website shortly so if there's you know anybody who couldn't watch tonight then you know tell them to go on and watch again or if you want to watch back. So thank you once again um, my name is Alison Schofield on behalf, behalf of um, Journal of Community Nursing, um, Wound Care People and Mill Digital and we will be back with you very soon for a very special event, Nursing Students the community and you and that is in collaboration with the Queen's Nursing Institute. I'm so excited about that one. So just follow our Facebook for all future events and announcements. So once again, thank you and have a marvellous rest of your evening, everybody. And we will shall see you again here very soon.